Hello, and welcome to Research Software, our number, well, whatever we're on. 15, maybe? <laughs> Somewhere around 15. This is 15. Yeah, hello, everybody. Yeah. Hello from Norway. Today we got snow. Yeah. Hmm. No nice. snow here. I know slow weather. <laughs> yeah. Here, just lots of rain and wind. Yeah. Pretty big here. storm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so what are we talking about today? Containers. So, containers. So, what's a container? A box. <laughs> a box. <laughs> a box like my cat sits in? <laughs> yes, I think that's uh, how it was presented to me the first time. Mm -hmm. I think someone showed me like a real box. And, uh, yeah. It's, it's a bit nice. Like, like shipping containers. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what people yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a nice image when you mm -hmm. show yeah. this uh, shipping container. You think that it's very well uh, organized logistics. And right. That's yeah. what you are aiming for. But I, I think the first time they showed me, it was really like a box. And uh, they mm -hmm. were explaining you will put everything in mm -hmm. the box and yeah. you can give the box to your uh, colleagues. But so in the container, uh, what like what's being what's actually in the container that we're talking about? Maybe you, yeah, we need to design, yeah. define exactly what is a container, what so, is an image. So someone has objected to this before, but I described it as the entire operating system is in the box, and instead of sending the software which has to be installed on something, you're sending it pre-installed on an entire operating system. So this isn't entirely true because the container shares a little bit of the operating system of your own computer. But I think as a working model, that's more accurate than anything else. I think it's a nice, yeah, I think it's yeah. a nice way to explain it. Because conceptually, it's probably very hard to understand all the details mm -hmm. of the container. Yeah. But in essence, it's... Actually, we'll show this later. Yeah. Because uh, like when people explain it, they say that it's layers and it's mm -hmm. files. Yeah. So I think underneath, it's just files. But I think it's good to look at it as a mm -hmm. operating system and the whole environment. Also, I started thinking about that I think container is an, it is an abstraction. Mm. It's one thing. I also started to think of it as a time capsule. So it can mm -hmm. be used as a time capsule, like if we put everything in, close it off. Yes, that's a nice mm. one. Yes, that's very mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. I like it. And, and also, like when when people talk about containers, it's, I think it's often three different things. It's uh, the recipes, yes, mm -hmm. the images, and the containers. Yeah. Yes. And I think it's good if we. Define, this, yes. yeah. define these things. What is the recipe? Mm -hmm. We show some examples. What is the yeah. image? We show some examples. And then how can we create containers on our computer? Yeah. Yes, that's a very so, good point because I was very confused initially yeah. uh, about the three, three different things. And I was using the wrong word for the wrong thing. And uh, people mm -hmm. trying to help were very, very confused. Mm -hmm. I think it's good if we. Right. Yeah. So to go back to something. Radovan said about the time capsule. What if we said it's an operating system in a time capsule that's being distributed as files around? Yeah, I think which can good. be run. Yeah. Even though Docker can... itself isn't actually files usually, but we can pretend. I think it's nice to see it as file. Yeah. Or, or it's sent around like files. Well, whatever. This is a small point. So yeah, so recipe, image, container. Should we show this uh, this this figure that comes from this paper that we will also mention later? And I will put the yeah I will put the link to the paper on into the HackMD. So we will discuss that later. It's a recent paper, mm -hmm. a really nice paper with ten. What That's is it? very ten good. Yeah. For reproducible research with containers, I will paste it in the HackMD. I think it's very nice because it's a uh, very simple rules, mm -hmm. and it it can help you a lot. And I, I was checking like, oh yes, I miss this one, and I wish I knew it and, uh, like uh, five years ago when I started. <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah. 
Uh, so this is the recent paper. Should we show this image there? Yeah. Uh, okay. Can yes. you share the screen? Yes. I just need to rearrange here my zoom thing. Just a sec, I will do it. Okay, working on it. I need to resize. Let's see if it is <laughs> Okay, are you ready? Yes. Here we go. So this is a figure from the paper. The paper is uh, this one here. Ten simple rules for writing Docker files for reproducible data science. Highly recommend. It appeared nine days ago, last week. and. In this paper is this figure here, I will zoom in, and it shows this analogy. So on the left side we have, well, let's imagine we build and run a C, C++ code. It could be Fortran, could be anything else. So we start from the source code, we compile the source code into an executable binary, and then we can start the binary and this will create a process. And if I want, I can start the same binary 10 times on my computer, and then I have 10 processes, if I want to. And on the right side, we see the analogy to in Docker or, or other containerization um, technologies. So the equivalent of the source code is the Docker file. And the Docker file is a recipe. It's a script of instructions on how to build an image. And the image is composed of layers. So there is this layer one, layer two, layer three. But as Richard said, it's good to think of the image as it's a, it's a blueprint for an operating system. Mm -hmm. And from this blueprint, from this image, with Docker run, I can then create, I can run containers. And inside the container, I can do something. So the container is then the equivalent of a process. So from the same image, I can create many, mm -hmm. many containers. Mm -hmm. And for the layers, I had this idea at some point. The thing that Docker figured out was how to have the layers to make it efficient to distribute the container images, because distributing a whole operating system for every program is rather inefficient. But by doing something clever with layers, they're able to make the size and distribution problem manageable. What do you yes. say this is mm -hmm. true? Is it specific to Docker, these layers, or is it uh, true for mm. all containerization? Because I had the feeling it's yeah. not necessarily the same. But yeah. At least singularity. Sure. I don't think singularity does, because one container is one file. So in, 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 I think in both, in many approaches, we can build new images based on other images. Yes, but, that's true, yeah. But I think the, in the layering, the, the two differ. And I'm not an expert, but uh, like Docker uses this layered file system. Mm -hmm. There we can really uh, have layers and they are cached. They can be cached. And then there can be a strategy on how we should order the layers. And I think we will come back yeah. to, to that later. So what should we put in the first layer? What should we put in the last layer? And in a singularity, at least the way I use it is that I, I get one file per image. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the same for me. But I, I, what I don't fully understand if, uh, if, if this is because there is no layer or no concept of layers in singularity. It's the same for Cyrus, for instance. I have the feeling there is no layer. But it's maybe mm -hmm. because I don't fully understand. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I, I think, uh, I think yeah. the requirements on the file system are simpler in the same mm -hmm. singularity. Yes. Yeah. But I think that the layers aspect isn't really too important from the user point of view, at least not at the level we are at now. Maybe by the end yeah. of the, once we start looking at the files, it becomes important, but maybe we can. I, think that's it. I mean, you're right. Usually when you go for a training on Docker, they insist a lot of, on these layers, mm -hmm. which usually you don't understand mm -hmm. very well. <laughs> and it's probably a, a, not the key concept. Yeah. I think this, this picture yeah. really summarizes, it yes. summarizes mm -hmm. very well. And when these layers yeah. are discussed, it's often discussed in, in the context of efficiency. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, 
we will show some examples. So we will show an example for a Docker file. We will show an example for an image. And then later, we will, we will also discuss some of the lessons learned from this paper. And then we will come back to that. And one, one uh, really important message from this paper, which I really like, is that we should focus on transparency and readability, understandability, mm -hmm. or maybe much more important than efficiency for many. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting question on how can the, uh, the DMG files on Mac OS X. Um, how do these compare to containers? I guess they don't have the whole operating system there, but does it have all of the support libraries needed to run something? Or does it still depend on the system somewhat? It's probably depending on the system because I cannot use it on my Windows machine. Mm -hmm. True, yeah, so it has to have some dependencies. Maybe we can come back to that, but. Because that's maybe yeah. something we haven't uh, mentioned yet is uh, the Docker. You are supposed to be able to run it on mm -hmm. different machine once you have mm -hmm. built it. Yeah. But this this DMG file, I, I guess it's only valid on, on another Mac. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it's sort of a question, do you distribute all the compiled, like do you distribute static byte programs that can run anywhere, or does it depend on other things? But maybe we should go on and not mm. drag mm. this out too much. Yeah, so what we can do is that we maybe show an example. Uh, it will be also fun then if we, before we discuss the paper and these findings, if we discuss how do we use containers, mm -hmm. like what are typical what are typical use cases? Yeah, sounds good. Who wants to go first? So should I unshare here? Sure, I guess we can. Mm -hmm. So. Mm. So how yeah. do you use it? <laughs> yeah. Do you use container? <laughs> or do you help other to yeah. use container? Who are you asking? I don't, both of you. <laughs> I, I'm using container for myself. But yeah. I, I, I like to hear if you, you are yeah. using or you are helping people to use it. Yeah. So on our cluster, we use containers to deploy some difficult to install software or things which are distributed basically only as containers and don't have any other reasonable installation method. So there's some sort of automated build process that will take the image and then um, build it and then deploy it to the cluster so it can be loaded with module load and then run. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't set this up, but one of my colleagues did. So that's one use case. The case where I first started really using them is for Jupyter Hub which uses Kubernetes yeah. and uses containers in the background to deploy the user environment. And here, I don't think I use them the way they're meant to be, because here it really is not a container to run a single application, but I'm trying to put the whole operating system in a container. So it has editors, multiple of them. It has yeah. Python, all the different Python libraries, which someone may need in a giant 14 gigabyte Docker image, which... So why do you think this is not how it should be? Uh... Well, so if you read the... Um, well, it's not how it should be for science or one of the well, you do You can do like, science, uh, yeah. Like people, it's... like most of the time when people talk about best practice, they're talking about micro applications or microservices kind of things. Yeah, because they, they talk here... in the context of workflows, like uh, mm -hmm. having containers in, into uh, like a scientific mm -hmm. workflow. Yeah. But I think your use case is, I find it very relevant. This is yeah, I mean... one of the most <laughs> basic use case we have to, because this is one of the most useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is to make sure everyone has the same environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, it is easy to deploy. Mm -hmm, exactly. That's so. I think it's yeah. a super good use case. Yeah. One drawback is a big image. Yeah, it big has image. the same problem. And ours is so big; it's not really maintainable and hardly reproducible. 
but we can come back to that later. Yeah. So, who's next? So you have mentioned reproducibility. I mean, that's maybe maybe one of the, one of the most important use cases: reproducibility. So something can be rerun by somebody else later, maybe on a different computer. Mm -hmm. Then the way I use it, so sometimes supporting others, but mostly for myself. Uh, one problem this it works on my computer. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Several people working on the same code. One person observes a problem, but the problem doesn't happen on the other person's computer. And now with a container, we can actually agree on having the same computer. Yes. So we mm -hmm. can run this test in a isolated, well-defined environment. And the, the definition is then the recipe file. And then we can both agree that we see the problem or we don't see the problem. So that's one use case. I also use it to, if I use some software maybe twice a year, and I don't want to install it in, on my computer, then I like to uh, put it in a container. And then I can use the container twice a year, but it's not part of my system mm -hmm. installation. So yeah, you can my, remove my it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Nice. yeah. So okay. that's very good use cases. Yeah. A few interesting questions. So there was, mm. like, what is the advantage of these containers? So if the software it's available through Conda or PyPI or something else. Oh, or yeah. I... So this I, I can tell you, because uh, initially I thought like um, having Conda would solve all my problems. <laughs> and I would tell everyone to just install mini Conda and then I give mm. them an environment.yaml and everything is fine. But then mm. I realized that every single person on their own laptop had different uh, libraries or set up uh, installed. And they always came up with new problems, and uh, I, I couldn't figure it out why. Because, as you said, it worked on my computer, but it didn't work on their computer. And it, it was endless to, to solve it. Where mm -hmm. when you move to Docker container, then mm -hmm. it completely disappeared. And mm -hmm. we use both. So in the Docker, yeah. we are, are having mini Conda and environment.yml, but then we have the same computer. So the Conda and PyPI and everything can be fine if this is if we don't use if these don't use any system libraries but yeah. at the moment mm -hmm. when, when they when we start to use system libraries we can have small differences but even in conda i mean you are supposed to use all the library from the conda package but then if if it is interfere with some libraries you have put in your ld mm -hmm. library pass for mm -hmm. instance and you don't remember and it it was not on always them it was sometimes me adding mm -hmm. things in my library pass it was working for one reason or another or having different results. Mm -hmm. So this is one of, of the uh, reason uh, now I think container is much better for this. Yeah. And there is maybe one more use case I wanted to mention that I use it for, and that is testing something in isolation. So mm -hmm. even though mm -hmm. it works yes. on my computer, and even though I try to do everything correctly, it, mm -hmm. uh, it could be that I introduce some dependency that I don't see. Yeah. And yeah. this way I kind of force myself to not depend on things that are only exist on my computer. So yeah. I test it in a well-defined environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and I, I think the last use case we have is to, you if you want to have a Docker, you ask your system administrator to install Docker only once, and then you can install mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. If you if you have many packages to install, and every week you ask yeah. your system administrator to install a new package, they mm -hmm. will be fed up with you. They will help yeah. you because there is too much work. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, with a Docker container, it's much faster, and I, I think it it please uh, it will please everyone. Yeah. Yes, and also this was why it was so important for me that we inst have make this available on supercomputers also. Yes. And we will talk about that later. So we will show Singularity, which is maybe the the supercomputer equivalent of a do Docker uh, technology because then we give users the flexibility to, in principle, install any software they want, and mm -hmm. they don't have to wait for us. Yeah. Yeah, yes, and it's true. Mm -hmm. well, I want to mention one more use case, and that is uh, sometimes the data is too big or too sensitive to leave the computer. 
So if I want to do data analysis, sometimes we need to send the computer to the data, not the data to the computer. Oh, yes. That's a very then, good uh, yeah. Then the, then the Docker image or whatever can be the computer, you send it to the, to the data, it does the analysis, and uh, the data doesn't have to leave. Yeah, I guess this is mm -hmm. what they do for sensitive data. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Should we look at some examples? Yeah. And then, uh, then later we can come back to that, to the ten rules and revisit uh, and mm -hmm. check our examples against that. Yeah. Uh, who can share the screen and go through it? Do you want me to show the, the example on QCIS? But then you will, uh, mm -hmm. uh, because the plan was you rather than to show singularity from it, or do you want to? Yeah, so what you could do is that you show you show QGIS. We we try to pull the image, we have a look at the Docker, we, we have a look how how does a Docker file look, what mm -hmm. can one do with it. And later, what we can do later, I take the screen and I try to do the same thing with I try to import this image into Singularity. Mm -hmm. And I will try to import this image also on a cluster. So then we can also discuss what is the difference between Singularity and Docker. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. OK, so you want me to share my screen? Yes. Yes, and we um, can then navigate you. I need to find the right uh, screen, too. What do you see, if I say? Let me see. I see a desktop. Is it empty? Or? Uh, I see a GitHub repository. Yeah, OK. So that's good. That's a GitHub where you have the, the recipe. Mm -hmm. Is it readable? Uh, if you can make it larger, that would be good. So what's? Just... Uh, this is for um, geograph uh, geographical information system. Mm -hmm. So okay. this is a, a software where you have a lot of dependencies. Mm -hmm. I can put here um, the address I of see. this one. So mm -hmm. this is a, like a free software. Mm -hmm. And normally, at, in university, at least in the geosciences, they have a, a commercial software, Arches, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is quite expensive. So the goal was to, to have something free mm -hmm. and available. And the thing is that it, it's quite tricky to install on some platform. So that's mm -hmm. the first use case we had like five years ago, where I was asked to install it on, on the Red Hat machine. And I spent mm -hmm. like two weeks and it was a nightmare. And then you <laughs> had the pressure because it had to be available. Right. Uh, and I changed the source code and I made it work. And then uh, three months later, the user came back and they wanted to have the newer version. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I will never manage. So we tried yeah. to do this container, okay. which was to make a recipe on yeah. how to run it. So most places is uh, quite uh, simple. And here you can. We okay. can already see what we write in the recipe. Yeah. So you want to go through it line by line? Yes. So and this is what is recommended from uh, from for instance, from this paper. Uh, mm -hmm. This from is to start, and you start usually from an existing mm -hmm. image, um, which is quite an old one here yeah, because this is uh, four years mm -hmm. old. So it was probably like the latest version at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it then from this you have already a good operating system, which is a full Ubuntu. So the right. goal was to run it, for instance, on Red Hat, uh, which always have quite uh, obsolete mm -hmm. packages for, yeah, like in geosciences at least. Yeah, but Ubuntu is usually quite up to date, so you have uh, like full uh, access to many libraries. Mm -hmm. um, Second line yeah. is, uh, I think it's just a comment. Yeah, like there's some metadata or something. Yeah, so, so it's you know mostly. About it. I don't even mm. know if you see it when you run it. It was mostly mm. here in the GitHub. Yeah, speaking of which, I've never seen these when I've run it. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. So and no then we get... start to have all these runs. 
-hmm. And I have to, to say, we didn't know anything when we started. <laughs> so, for instance, this concept of layers and things like that. We, mm -hmm. I, I went to a training where people were talking with layers. And mm -hmm. I had no clue what they were talking yeah. about. So, uh, the way we, we run it is we copy past mostly. Uh, so, when you go in the pages, normally somewhere there is some information on how to install it on your mm -hmm. machine, which is probably somewhere here. And it will show Windows because mm -hmm. I'm a Windows machine. And we try to mimic this instruction because you have instruction on Ubuntu and we just copy past the different lines we had. So the different lines is just uh, the list of commands we had in the documentation. It was absolutely not related to trying to optimize the layers or whatever. So mm -hmm. we, we added yeah. this because we had this in the documentation. Yeah, like with only this many layers, it doesn't really matter if there's more, but... No, but uh, we had some... no clue. I mean, yeah. honest, we had no mm -hmm. clue. And uh, it, for instance, here we had... Uh, so here we, we mostly uh, add some uh, the pages for this Debian and for the Xenial, which was this Ubuntu 16.04, uh, for having uh, for being able to install mm -hmm. with apt-get. And yeah. then we update here, which was mm -hmm. what, what was written in the instruction, and then yeah. we install uh, yeah. a few packages, which is uh, related to QGIS. Yeah. And this basically looks like a shell script here. So there's yeah. run in front, but it's basically... It's, it was really much like the... Yeah, exactly. It was like a script. And before, usually, if I uh, had to send some instruction to someone on how to install QGIS on, on Ubuntu mm -hmm. uh, laptop, I will send this. Mm -hmm. or I will <laughs> skip these two lines, yeah. I, and I will remove the, the run. And yeah. uh, I will send exactly this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a great point, because it also shows that even if we decide not to use the Docker image, we can use the Docker file as a documentation. Yes. So it, it can serve as a documentation also on its own. And I'm also looking a little bit at the paper, and we will come back to that. But the paper discusses how mm -hmm. to order things, and mm -hmm. just very generally. Mm -hmm. We often start with system libraries, and that's what you do here. So you do apt-get install. Yeah. And mm -hmm. later we install own software. Yeah, which or, we don't have here. Yeah. Which which is not here. Then con configuration files. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then at the end, so entry points. Yes. And I think the general recommendation is that if if we worry about efficiency and about size and about reusing the cache, then we should mm -hmm. start with the things that will change the least. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we put the things that are likely yeah. to change the most. Yes, yeah, that's right, yes. And it's good to have something which here it was like uh, you would have it for every QGIS installation, you would need to do this. Um, and then you could add some more if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. But uh, honestly, when uh, when I wrote this, I, I had no clue what I was uh, doing in terms of Docker. I was uh, just uh, copying the recipe we had for installation. And I think it, it was good that uh, usually you have for every single software, if you look at the documentation, you will have a description on how to install it. And usually mm -hmm. that's a good baseline for writing your recipe. Yeah. And you add this run before. Mm -hmm. I don't it's, know if this is a good yeah. practice. <laughs> I think it's basically what I would do. So I might combine some of the run commands into one if they're closely related, but whatever it's so short, then I think it doesn't really matter that much. So maybe we could say everyone, did we, did we already say that every one of these run commands makes a new layer? And no, uh, yeah. each layer depends on the layer before. So let's say Anne changed line eight here that yeah. installed some different packages. So lines four, five, and seven wouldn't have to run again. It would use that existing thing there. So that that's why they want you to put the things that change less, less often earlier, because whenever you change something, it's less likely to make everything else after it get rebuilt. 
Yeah, we can also see line 11, 12, they are chained together. Mm -hmm. So this will not create yeah. two different layers, mm -hmm. it's one layer because it, they, they belong together. Mm -hmm. And now, so we have this Docker file, and this this is now you keep it on GitHub. Yes. And that's, so you keep it under version control and that, that's good. And yeah, you, but uh, I mean, honestly, if you look at it, I probably have very few commits. Um, yeah, six. I, I only changed mm -hmm. it uh, today because I had a typo, and then I realized, oh, it, 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 it rebuilt everything. But it's, I like two things about it. It's under version control, and also it's publicly available. So if I want to, yeah. if I want to use the image, and we will have a look at the image in a moment, I can actually inspect how was the image built. I would be hesitant using an image if I don't see the Docker file, mm -hmm. because yes. then I don't know what was what was put inside. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you how do you now build the image out of that recipe? So usually, so I, I will clone. I can do it. I don't know if you can see my terminal. Oh, I probably yes, have it. now okay. or yeah, it's visible. It's a bit mm. tiny, but visible. It's, uh, I can change the font probably somewhere. Mm. Configuration display. Uh, I don't know how to change uh, this, the font size. <laughs> Well, okay. yeah, it is, gets... is it too? Yeah, okay. I'm not sure if I do this. It doesn't uh, increase it because I would normally clone it. And, uh, yeah. So, do you build the image locally, or do you let like Docker Hub or? So I would uh, uh, this one. I can. Uh, I I would let uh, Docker Hub uh, to do it. But usually, this is how I do it. So I will always put first in version control. Then I try to build it locally. Until it works, right? And then once it yes. works, uh, you, then you let a Docker yeah. Hub or one of the other services uh, build it for you automatically. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So here I will, uh, uh, normally I will try to do it from here. Um, and this is also to show how you build uh, the image. Mm -hmm. So we do this Docker build. Um, and is it minus T? Or the tag. I have it in my history. <laughs> uh, build. Uh, yeah. So that's how I would do it. Build. <laughs> dot minus C for the tag. And here, this is a name you want to build. So usually, when I build it locally, I put a, a like a test. Just, and I, I don't put any tag. So that's usually the first thing I do. I don't know how you do it. Hmm. And this is mostly to check yeah. that it works. So I don't bother uh, uh, writing a very long tag yet, which is a tag I will use in GitHub. Um, I build it. It has already some, and this is where you see actually the layer because it says mm -hmm. pooling library Ubuntu, and it says already exists, already exists. Mm -hmm. and this is a different layer. Yeah, and this is why the layers are so useful. So anything that yeah. uses Ubuntu 16.04 can share these layers, so it doesn't have to be downloaded or take up extra space. Yes, and that's a very good point about the space because initially I, I, I had no clue what this layer were about. But then I realized quickly that it was very useful to put uh, to have a Docker container containing all the baseline for the libraries we were using, mm -hmm. because then it, it was not using too much space. Mm -hmm. And then here is building something. And I think here it does everything you would do on the command line if you had a Ubuntu mm -hmm. machine and you were a root. Yeah. So no, so it looks like Ubuntu, but actually your computer is, is it a Windows or? No, it's a CentOS machine, this one. CentOS. So now we have, so your laptop is a CentOS, but it looks like Ubuntu. So that's really nice. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I can run it the same in, uh, in my Windows laptop and uh, I, I can build in the same way. 
a container on my Windows laptop, which is a Linux container, which is quite nice in that sense. And, and same on like Mac. So now we can run Linux yeah. on Mac and we can run something on something else. Yes. Also, we have actually quite many interesting questions on HackMD, so we should have some time yeah. to answer them later. Maybe we can uh, try to look at uh, why it's building. What question do we have? Ah, oh, yes. It's unsuccessful Docker builds. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, actually, because... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> That's something you learn the hard way to initially when you do a Docker a build, etc. Or even when you start to run a, a Docker and it fails, it was um, it, it's filling up your slash TMP because it's usually where it is, and you don't really realize. And then you can crash the machine, which happened to me uh -huh. a, a lot on the cloud. So I was using this uh, the university cloud, and I create a machine, and then I was uh, trying to do something mm -hmm. with the container, but of course I was um, so inefficient. It was always failing, and then the machine crashed, and I had mm -hmm. to destroy the machine completely. So what happened to do that? Too many? Well, you fill up uh, with big images. <laughs> <laughs> and then if your slash TMP is completely full, uh, the machine, you, you cannot even log in in the machine. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you lose the control. Uh, yeah, I had to stop it. <laughs> yeah, running so it out happened to me many times. Running so now, I, I even did a small guide for people on yeah. how to, to do this print because mm. I, I, I oh, always okay. messed up. Um, and I think I can do for instance here, but usually, what I look at so is this just to see your images that are running which is none of the one I, I'm using now. But otherwise, you have these Docker images, which are all the images you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for instance, here you see there is one with none, and it happens to me very often when you break something. Mm -hmm. So how do you delete this one? So there is a way to delete individual images. One can also clean up the whole thing. Yes. And I can never remember if I have a cheat sheet somewhere where I just how to prove Yes, this. I also have this cheat sheet somewhere. But <laughs> uh, a few comments. So we had uh, like a cheat sheet with a few comments. Oh yeah, something I, I use very often is to check the status when it's exited. For Docker, yes. Mm -hmm. So if you do a Docker, yes, you see all the different images, but some of them are running, and maybe some of them are you don't see the one are exited. Well, if you do this PS and you filter by status, um, so you can see I have a lot more because uh, usually this is my my failed attempt to do something. And this is the one you, you should uh, mm. destroy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I usually look over. You know, every time I run a container, I always use a dash dash rm option. Yeah. To so that's a very good practice, actually. Because otherwise, you can end up having this kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then you need to delete them. Uh, so here, if you do a Docker, mm -hmm. you can do it manually. Docker RM, and you can. So here's the first one is a container ID. Mm -hmm. and you, you can. But should we try to actually run some image and show? Yeah. Let's... Yeah. So this one is uh, is is built normally. Somewhere. I have it here, so I can run it. So. What is good, I see good practice too, is to, uh, to explain how to run it, actually. And uh, I, I saw in the in the paper, it even says, um, you should make sure it's uh, it's one one command to run it, mm -hmm. which is yeah, so not right. done. So the one command should be the most uh, typical use case. Yes. And they also recommend to put this um, usage example into the Docker file. So to add a comment on 
sort of if I only get the Docker file and I didn't ever see this uh, readme, mm -hmm. I should be able to deduce how to use it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So actually, this one is uh, it's built automatically in uh, in Docker Hub, and we have also some documentation here on how to run it. It's maybe a bit tiny. So every time we push uh, something in the repository, it will create the latest here. Mm -hmm. mm. So to to run it, for instance, this one was four years old. I, I copy past this without uh, knowing what I was doing. You can do because I couldn't remember honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I ran this command. And this one looks a little bit more complicated than the usual. Docker command because it I think it mounts uh, different. But we can parts. explain, yes, yeah. But yeah. So it does things like it makes the home directory available inside. It makes the graphical yeah. applications work with this X11 stuff. Um, Not yeah. So it, it's, uh, main... it's running QGIS. So QGIS is a graphical interface. So this is why you have this uh, this one here, and I think this display here, and this one here, which is uh, um, so V is for the volume. So you pass your disk and you map it. So here, for instance, uh, the, my dollar home in in my local machine will be this dollar home user in the Docker container. Now I need to move. So it has started. I don't know if you see mm -hmm. the so, graphical interface. So this is running inside of the container. Yeah. So this yeah. is QGIS. And mm -hmm. this, this was the first use case where uh, we wanted to have this application runnable uh, easily. So what mm -hmm. we did is uh, as a bit like what you do, uh, Richard, is to have um, a module load. Mm -hmm. QGIS, and we had a script uh, doing this complicated line here, everything here. So the user were doing module load QGIS and the version, and then QGIS, and the QGIS was doing this mm -hmm. instead. Yeah. Which I don't know if this is good or not, but uh, yeah. at least this is how we did it. OK. Mm. Can we show a? container that runs some command line usage of a container somehow. Yeah, this one you can also do this command line, I guess. Mm. Let me check what I have. Uh... I have the Ubuntu. We can use the Ubuntu image. We have the recent one. So how do you run the Ubuntu image? Mm -hmm. So to run this, always Docker run. Docker run. Or should we show how to pull the image? Or? Yeah, let's start with that. So let's say you've been told there's an image somewhere. Yeah. So. How, where do you search for images? Because that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Because uh, mm -hmm. Radovan said he shouldn't, he, he wouldn't like to take an image if he doesn't see the source or oh, mm -hmm. the Docker file. So where mm -hmm. do you search for this? Also, where do we find like official images? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I usually search on Docker Hub. So for instance, I search Ubuntu, Docker Hub. Mm -hmm. But now then, not always on. Uh, so what's Docker Hub and how does it relate to Docker? I don't know if it really relates to Docker in that mm -hmm. sense. It's a, it's a registry of uh, images. Mm -hmm. And what people typically do is that they, con they connect Docker Hub yeah. with, let's say, GitHub. They keep the Docker file on GitHub, GitLab, wherever. And then every time we change it, or it rebuilds the image. And then the images yeah. are hosted here on the registry. And then there yeah. are other registries. So there is, uh, this is not the only one. Quay. So there is Quay, and there is, uh, yeah. uh, there is GitLab registry. And uh, these days, we can even have 
containers on on GitHub, yes. and there is Singularity Hub. Yes, yeah. you can have your own. There are plenty of uh, them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is what is tricky, I found, because there are so many different ones. So, for instance, when I search for uh, mm. official images, I tend to so, search on Docker Hub. Okay, so I guess we could say that all of these registries are like PyPI or the Anic the Conda repositories yes, or something yeah. like that, except instead of distributing one single software, they're dis they're distributing the entire operating system images. Well, container yes. images, but basically the whole operating system. Yeah. And then and the, what is good is to find official uh, mm. images. Mm -hmm. There's a question on HackMD. Are there any open registries as an alternative to Docker Hub? Uh, Docker Hub is open. Uh, Quay I mean. is open. I don't pay for Docker Hub or. Uh, I guess there's different open, okay, open source registries. Open Singularity source Hub. registry. Singularity Hub is all open source. Okay. I think there are many uh, registry where you, but it's I don't know if this is how official it is. Mm -hmm. Like there is a bioinformatics, they have a registry for all the images, and the, I think it's it's a bit. Uh, I don't know exactly the story. But that's a good question because often yeah. it's actually a company behind it. Yes. Uh, and they can, okay. of course, we can put the, the images there and it can be free to use. But yeah. uh, it can also be then a surprise. What if they mm -hmm. later decide that, well, we don't host them anymore? So, how about reproducibility? And I mean, this yeah. happened recently. But it's the same yeah. for GitHub, actually. Yeah. So that's the same uh, problem. There's... Maybe, maybe one, one answer is that. Or the model. I mean, you can put you can exactly. Put image, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. yeah. So what? That's, that's what we do actually for private images, because private images, uh, yeah. if you want to use Docker Hub or Quay, you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, if the image is not too big, you can make it. Uh, you can put it on uh, Zenodo and make mm -hmm. it private. Yeah. So also, like there is this. The question got elaborated. So basically, a registry you can run yourself. Like if you have sensitive data and images, you don't want exactly. to. Exactly. So yeah. I would say if it's really sensitive, you might not even trust the public yes. the clouds. But I know our university, we installed Portus um, as a self-hosted, I guess it's open source registry if we're running it. Um, but yeah, but I guess as for that, I'd also say maybe you would want to separate the sensitive data from the image. I mean, maybe the code itself is mm -hmm. confidential, but... Um, yeah, but yeah. It, for instance, uh, we have private images because we are using Intel compilers uh, for uh, compiling the model, and there are parts you are not allowed to distribute. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is one reason, and yeah. you can have a commercial software, uh, so you get it and you can install it, uh, uh, and you can distribute it within your company, but yeah. maybe not outside. Yeah. But there's several good points here. So it's all about registries, but to me, I sort of wonder why do we have to have this other infrastructure for distributing the images when we can. Like singularity, an image is a file. Storing large files is a well, uh, like well-established problems. There's data repositories and things like that. Yeah, I think that's that a good point. trying to, like if you do need something stored a long time, we can try to make it a like archive, export the yeah. images and make it like the file archive and then somehow mm -hmm. store it that way. I think the problem uh, is usually mm -hmm. national uh, archive are quite reluctant to, to store mm -hmm. uh, images. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for instance, we tried a few times and uh, it was rejected on the on the national archive. Mm -hmm. But it, it, for instance, on Zenodo, you can really uh, do it very easily. And I, I think the main issue is people probably don't relate it as a, it's like a binary and they don't relate it as a file. But mm -hmm. it's true. We could uh, actually we could archive it 
in the same way we archive any other mm -hmm. data. So yeah. for instance here, if I want to take, uh, is it 20.4 or, yeah. or 4, which yeah. is, I think, the latest. So here I'm taking the image, which I have already. And usually the documentation is quite uh, uh, good on how to, to use it. So they explain quite uh, a lot. I mean, here there is no Docker run. Like one, the, the one question that I would have now is which version should I use? Should I use latest? Should I use a specific one? And yeah. I, mean, I will also already answer it myself is that one, one recommendation from the paper is that if I want to then really publish the Docker file as part of my analysis, it's good if I refer to a specific version, not the latest, because that will change. Yeah. And that's a mistake mm. uh, uh, we made, for instance, for this repository. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Initially, I didn't realize it was a good practice. So, for instance, it was only the latest in Docker Hub. And so I pulled uh, the version uh, and then the latest. So I had it on my computer and then I realized there were a typo in the readme. So I fixed it and then I push it and then it overwrote uh, uh, the latest. Uh, mm. So I, this is why I pushed this one for the version. And I realized reading the paper, I, I, I could uh, I could uh, have done it better and uh, really pin the version. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really important to do. Mm -hmm. Make a release, uh, and then your release will be will become a, a, a Docker image. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Um, the only thing mm -hmm. I, I sometimes don't really know, for instance, I take a, here, you, you want to take the latest Ubuntu image. Which, which version would you take from Ubuntu? I would probably start with the latest, I mean, not the, yeah. uh, not the latest word, but the 20, what is it, 2004, uh, with the latest number. I would probably start that if yeah. that works. Mm -hmm. I mean, by, work, for I instance, here there is a stable. Um, so you would take this 20, 20 or 4. Or 2010. And then yeah, if, okay. if, if it doesn't work because I don't know, the software depends on something older, yeah, yeah, I would go yeah, backwards. Yeah. Yes, so I, I think that's what I would try to do, but I don't know if this is a really good practice. So let's try to run it. How yeah. do you run it? Docker, run. And there are plenty of options you can put. You need to know where it is. Can we try to get like a shell of Ubuntu? Or? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. we should uh, be able to, to Also, we have not too much time left. It would be good yeah. to discuss some some of the points of the paper, maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe we should discuss the paper instead, no? Yeah. So it's just some points. I mean, we could now uh, get a shell, so we could actually go into that container and look around. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can show that with Singularity. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. What else? Yeah, um, Richard mentioned that one can yeah. do command line interfaces containerized. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure we have okay. a good example. This one yeah. one. So if I can list some of these uh, rules from the paper, one rule was uh, use existing tools. So there are tools like Redboard to Docker. So sometimes you don't have to even Invent this Docker file. You can convert. Yes. You can convert a Python project or an R project directly into a Docker file I'm and a Docker image with Docker. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there were several other older questions I thought we should answer. So the different runtimes. So contrast Docker from Singularity from the other common things. In which one do we recommend? And a good question about using it for development or sharing a dev environment or tool or library versus sharing a tool. Should we go to the paper first, though? Yes. Yeah, we're about to do should. that. And then we can yeah, do this. We'll come back to the uh, dev environment. So the question about Singularity versus Docker, we will come back to that. I will hopefully have time to show something at least about mm -hmm. that. I will stop sharing so you can show. Mm. Um, about the paper, so there is one recommendation was to build on top of existing images if we can. Mm. So mm -hmm. then there is caching, use official yeah. images. 
use version specific tags. Mm -hmm. uh, then recommendation was to prefer format uh, so to make it readable rather rather than super efficient. Mm -hmm. And efficient can be, I don't know, fast or small. Yeah. But often I think maybe primarily we should worry about readability and understandability. Yeah. Or document with the Docker file or, and um, and Anne has demonstrated it that we can use it also as instructions on how to install or adding metadata, including installation instructions. Or when we how to use it? How to use it? Then when we install software, or do we again do we take the latest software or do we pin versions? So mm -hmm. what if I install some Python dependencies? Or then the recommendation is also then to specify the software versions. Mm -hmm. So to pin the versions using version control, and we have planned that here. So we put the, we put the Docker file or the Singularity file together with the code mm -hmm. into the same Git repository. Yeah. So then it mm -hmm. then it can go with the project. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you, you say is that mostly we we need to follow uh, everything to make a reproducible environment, yeah. even without Docker. Yeah, yes. I mean, like the pin version, everything, things like that. Usually, what is recommended? Yeah, these all sound quite a lot like best practices for yeah. writing other software, like make it readable and not just documented, um, yeah, and not just fast, or make it include the source code along with, and don't just distribute the compiled version and so on. Yeah. Then, mm -hmm. uh, uh, how about data? We can take the data into the image, but we can uh, maybe better is if we mount the data at runtime. So maybe we can keep the data outside mm -hmm. of that image. Yeah, probably depend on the size of your data. Right. But it's, um, yeah, it's probably good to not to mount it, especially if you want data. to reuse it with other data. That's right. <laughs> then uh, maybe com coming back to one of the questions mm -hmm. was. The recommendation is to regularly use and rebuild containers. And also that means to me like eating own medicine. So even if I develop on my computer, I would still develop inside the container. Even during development. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't introduce the Docker file at the end of the project. Mm -hmm. So just like mm -hmm. one week before publishing, oh, let's create the Docker file. Yeah. Rather we already, if we have been using it for one or two years mm -hmm. during development. Mm -hmm. And then, if we have time, we can maybe comment a little bit on Singularity versus Docker. Yeah. Do we have the time for that? Yeah, why not? Uh, yes. So what are the use cases? I think so. Docker is the more popular one. I think also Docker, I think it existed before Singularity, I guess. Yes, um, I guess. Singularity is really good if you are on a system with lots of other users. For instance, high performance computing, supercomputer, shared system. It's mostly yeah. on system where your system administrator will not install Docker anyway. Yes. And why for not? security they... reason, for good reason. Yes, because in Docker you can become root. So for safety reasons, so there are not too many or clusters with uh, Docker installed. So there is Singularity, but Singularity can run Docker images. So we can import the Docker image into Singularity. I can show that. I also like to use Singularity on my computer because I find it simpler. Because I, I like that these are just files and I find the, I don't have to start any daemon. I found it always a bit complicated, like starting the Docker daemon. And it's just, I find it simpler. The, command line interfaces are simpler and I have less to type. So I don't need to look up these cheat sheets for Singularity. I like it a lot. So do you develop your, the, your container in Singularity already? Or you so have still a Docker file? Or? Yeah, if it's just for me, I use Singularity. But mm -hmm. if it's okay. with somebody else, I use a Docker file, but then I import it into Singularity. So on my computer, mm -hmm. I use Singularity, although I interact with Docker files. Should I show something here? On the yes. Share. Okay. And I will move that browser out. 
Tell me when. And I will move the terminal in. Yeah, it's already safe to share, there will be nothing. Okay. Just zoom preventing me from resizing. Okay, just a sec, resizing the terminal. So here what I will do is I will singularity pull the same image. This is the same image that uh, that Anne was showing. It, it was a Docker image. So here I'm pulling the Docker image into a into a singularity file. So I create a singularity image out of it. And this now goes super fast because also singularity caches things because I've done that before the show. So it's cached somewhere. Uh, but now I have this file here. And this file, this five, 600 megabyte file, that's my image. And now what I can do is I can, for instance, first of all, let me show you something on. So this is now on my laptop. Cat etc OS release. What is the operating system on my laptop? It's Manjaro Linux something something. So that's, um, that's the Linux that I use. But I will now go into, I want to now go singularity shell. Let's get a shell. I want to have a shell inside that image. And let's do the same thing here. Always release. And here suddenly I'm in Ubuntu. Yeah, the syntax is very nice actually. Yeah. And if I go out, um, also singularity, so many typos, run, I can, no, it's not called run, it's called exec. And here I can execute some commands directly. The nice mm -hmm. thing is, uh, the nice thing is that it, I don't have to mount anything, it's like it can already see my operator, it can see my files, my folders. So I could read from my disk and I can write to my disk. Of course I can redefine it, but I have like less less of things to set up. So I I really like that one. And if what I is nice is so here's a, you don't need to remove, you know. Um, you don't you don't have the uh, like Docker PS, Docker. Do so you there have are no, to right. there are no there are no really layers. This thing, this file here, it's still cached somewhere. So there is still somewhere on my hard drive these things are cached. Um. Because when I was when I was pulling it, it took like no time at all. Mm -hmm. So I can clean up the cache. But I see more directly. I like that I can actually see the image. I know where it is. Uh, and I can move it around and uh, I really like that. And I think we don't have the time, but I could show exactly the same steps on our cluster. And it would work exactly the same way. So our cluster is CentOS, but if I really, really need something that has Ubuntu and something that can only install with apt-get, I could create a singularity. Mm -hmm. Let me show, maybe maybe I can show you a singularity file. Maybe you, you can show it on a Saga. Right. It's nice. Yeah. Oh, whatever. Uh, let me show you a singularity Any file. Any singularity image, yes. Just that we see how that looks. Yes, the syntax is a bit different, no? Yes, let me show you that. I will, let's go to Pandoc. Come on, there. Pandoc. That's something I use a lot, but I didn't want to install it into mm -hmm. my system. Oh, this is nice, yes. Mm. So here I describe how I use it. I can pull it. This is actually a command line. I can use it as a command line tool. Let, let us look into the recipe. So this is the equivalent of a Docker file. Very neat. Yeah. And so I start mm -hmm. from Ubuntu 20.04. I do some up 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 install, so I install a few things. And Actually, yeah. that's even nicer because yeah. you can really copy past, like, like if it is a script. Yeah. That and here helps. I have an entry point. Mm -hmm. So if I run it directly, it, it will do this. Yeah. So it will behave like Pandoc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nice. And and I have a similar setup like you. So here, this this is the recipe is on GitHub, but the actual image is on Singularity Hub. Let's go there. Loading, loading. 
Aha, I need to log in. And here are some more my images, my collections. So I also have some open MPI uh, image sitting here. Yes, this mm. is nice. Mm. And again, there are labels and versions. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, you do it well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And this is shareable. This one. This, this yeah, is so nice. Anybody, so you can, can, yeah. anybody can pull this, these images. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this is a really nice, nice service here, Singularity Hub. It's not the only place to have Singularity images. Okay, I I only know that one. But... There is another one I have. Um, uh -huh. okay. Because there is this also the company behind actually Singularity. They have their own. Uh, oh, is it this registry? new one? Mm -hmm. I forgot the name. Singularity Registry. Because it's not called Singularity anymore. Is it? It's called Scilab something. Yes, Scilab, yes. So that's the other place. Oh, okay. I didn't know that, actually. Here. Okay, but you, is it still uh, keep this Singularity Hub? Yes. So I think Singularity Hub is so it's having different entities running these two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can pull from it from either of these. All right, should I stop sharing? Sure. But this is nice, very nice syntax. Actually. <laughs> so there's a question. Can you chmod plus x singularity dot image and then run it as an executable? Oh, it's a binary. What kind of format is it actually? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I never tried that. <laughs> I don't know what the question says. So I, so I run it with singularity run. Oh, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. it, do, it doesn't work without, uh, at, at least on my Windows laptop, it doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> because I, I tried it once. I, I made it, if you forget uh, Docker run, because I had an alias mm -hmm. and uh, with an environment variable, and it doesn't do anything. I haven't tried on um, the same system, actually. But let me, I will just try it here offline. Normally, I always try that with Singularity Run. Let me, let me just try that, and I will report what happens. Um, doesn't seem to work for me. Hmm. Okay, so yes, I guess it... it. Because there is a standard yeah. no, for, for the creation of this file, is it? Yeah. Hmm. This OCI standard. Uh, I don't know if it says how it, uh, it should be in the, in the file. Yeah. In Twitch chat, someone says, no, you can't run them like that. So okay. it would be nice if you could, but I guess it's not. Well, the format just doesn't work out. But it's a bit like a library or, uh, of, I mean, a file, a binary file, where you need a library to run or to uh, inspect the file. Yeah, this is the same. Yeah. Also some security concerns, tool. if that was possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yes. We have a question. Who do we ask when we need help with Docker Singularity? Something like Stack Overflow for them. Um. Actually, that's a good question because that's a f uh, in initially um, there are not so like Singularity. There is uh, very few documentation on mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. and very few people uh, can really help. So mm -hmm. I don't know where you find help rather than. Hmm. Yeah, there are uh, there is documentation, but it's in several places, and it took me a while to understand that. So the one place doesn't talk about the other place. I don't know why. Oh, and there, are, there is not only one standard to do things. So it took mm -hmm. me a while to piece things together. Yeah. But it is true, there is no, I mean, there are a few things in Stack Overflow, but not so much. And it will mostly be on Docker. And this is probably mm -hmm. why, for instance, I use more Docker if I can, because mm -hmm. I will find more help, mm -hmm. uh, like Singularity or Cyrus or any other. Um, 
containers you can use on HPC. Yeah. This is uh, very much uh, opaque in yeah. terms of uh, what you but, can do and how to do it. Yeah. But that said, the documentation is very good. Oh, there are good examples. But it's, it's good for people who understand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the approach that I did is that uh, to, to, f to look for something that is similar to what I want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, find, that's a good find it on GitHub. Yeah. Hopefully it has a license which allows me to look at it and use it and then take it and adapt it until it works on mm -hmm. my computer. Once it works on my computer, then I put it on Singularity Hub. But yeah. do you recommend to learn containers to start with Singularity or? Hmm. That's a very good question because I think there are many more examples on Docker, but I find Singularity simpler. I mean, mm -hmm. it, when, what you show, it, uh, it, it's very neat. I found it very neat in terms mm -hmm. of syntax. But I, I wonder if, uh, if, if, if yeah. uh, you would yeah. find enough like documentation, tutorial, because there are thousands of tutorials on Docker, which is yeah. why I, I found it was mm -hmm. very nice. I think for distributing images, I think one probably needs to start. It would be good to learn some Docker. Mm -hmm. If I only want to consume, I can probably, it may be simpler, but there is a lot less documentation and tutorials. Mm. It's really a trade off. Yeah. Any other questions? We also didn't discuss really what are the drawbacks of containers. Oh, yeah, let's. We yeah. discussed a bit. We said this is the same drawback as the other um, programming or installing installation if you don't follow best practices you have mm -hmm. the same drawback yeah. well someone's helping us by giving us a few more drawbacks so what yeah. are they are on a order yeah Ordinary. yeah so what we had written down was if you assume everyone always uses it in a container, then it, you might make something that's hard to use outside of a container. And this sort of relates to another idea someone had earlier. Oh, uh, what was it? So. Yeah, we have something hmm. about the binaries. Too. I had a problem uh, with the Intel compilers too. If if uh, there are some specificities, and then you go on a MD machine, then uh, yeah. your, your Docker image doesn't work because there is something yeah. in uh, Intel saying it's checking and it's not uh, hardware, so it doesn't work. And I, I was like, oh, okay, huh. okay. Oh, uh, let's see. So it's not always uh, fully uh, independent. Yeah. Yeah. So one criticism that one can one that I hear often, and some of it, so there is a point to it, is uh, that containers can can be a good excuse to for like bad software development practices mm -hmm. because I can kind of clog everything into the container and it will yeah, yes. work, but it's not really portable outside. I mean, Richard already mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can lose a bit of portability. Yeah, but I, I don't so, think most developers don't uh, don't use container to avoid portability. It's usually for for user, mm -hmm. I mean, a, yes. from a user point of view, it's easier to use. Yeah, but uh, it's true. It can be actually, for instance, the QGIS is uh, initially we use container because when we asked the developer, mm -hmm. he said they they can't care less about Red Hat and they will never support it. So it was a, a way to reduce the portability of yeah. the software on side, mm -hmm. which can happen for your own software. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. There's a good po comment here. Containers can become stale, contain uh, long known yeah. problems. I don't get the last part there, but. Yeah, so do we expect a container made now to run in 10 years? Or will there be some incompatibility between a newer kernel and older software? I think the last point saying uh, you can have an old image that works, but it's no longer possible mm -hmm. to recreate mm -hmm. it. I, I had it, this one. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Because, for instance, uh, as I said before, the Axaconda uh, packages were mm-hmm. removed, mm-hmm. so I had an image that was yeah. working. Cannot recreate. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah. So it should be what we should really strive for for reproducibility is that it's if we have the same source file, we get kind of the same binary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and also in future, which means that oh, it should yeah. be kind of stateless. If we mm-hmm. recreate it ten times, we should get ten times the same thing. Yeah. Yes. And and of course we can we can do it wrong. I mean we can do many mistakes that prevent that. But yeah. Yes. So and one okay. challenge will mm-hmm. be just to find the image in ten years. So <laughs> yes, again, exactly. The Zalodo, then at least yeah. I think then I'm confident it's there in ten years. And then the yeah. in principle the only dependency is on the kernel. Mm-hmm. So if yes. we can somehow get the same kernel. It should, in principle, still yeah. run. And I'm not so sure it will be so easy always, but I think, at least to my knowledge, is the closest that we can get to mm-hmm. rerunning the same thing in 10, 15 years. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for instance, the image I have, uh, like, for four years, I can rerun it. There are many things on my laptop I cannot rerun, and this is less mm-hmm. than four years. Because things have changed uh, libraries. So it's it, it, it helps. But it's probably not sufficient. But I don't mm-hmm. think there is a, a way to do it fully reproducible. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. For the, what you mentioned for open form is very true, especially on the HPC. If this is run on HPC, this uh, mm-hmm. containers. Mm-hmm. And for singularity containers, uh, it's very important to be able to match with the, op- the uh, MPI native library mm-hmm. and uh, you cannot do whatever you want so you cannot use any images which is usually very opaque to me yeah and i have to try it out and i have to fail <laughs> i don't know mm-hmm. why i need to use this and not that yeah uh, i thought of so what i had said before we started was if you're making a library that library needs to be installable even outside of a container so that people can remix it into other containers and actually reuse it. If you're making a tool and the tool will only be used in the container, then you can make it sort of bound to the container so it's not installable outside. But really, how often will people not want to mix your tool with other tools in the same Mm -hmm. execution environment? So I think that the container, yeah, we can't allow the container to replace making well-maintained, easy to install software. And it can sort of mask that problem by saying, oh, it's in the container, this is all you need. Well, um, mm -hmm. not exactly. Yes, that's so true. you should always make sure you can install it anyway. Yeah. And if you can't, if it's not easy to install, then like even just having the binary that exists in 10 years, if you can't recreate the container and it's too difficult to install not in the, outside of the container, then you can't maintain it and keep improving it if you found bugs or something. So just saying, oh, we have the container, we can reproduce it. It's like with open source software. So just being able to run software isn't considered enough to make it open. You need to be able to understand how it works and then improve it yourself and then reshare those distributions. So containers let you, containers alone let you run something, but not make these improvements that you may need. I think we have a comment that they can be very large. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's what the way you were saying, uh, yeah. Richard. You have very large mm-hmm. images. Mm. But files can be very large too. Libraries can yeah. be very large. Uh, the Anaconda installation can be quite large too. Yeah. And then there's a comment here for full reproducibility, you would bundle the source code for all dependencies inside each container. And you get some weird case where you use the container to recompile a new version inside of it in 
what however many years yeah and then you make it so deep that you have a container that has the pool development environment to rebuild your source code 10 years from now yes that would be but, that's nice yeah <laughs> but now you're trying really hard to get around making <laughs> uh software that's built well and can be reinstalled and remaintained or rebuilt hmm well yeah any other comments i guess we're soon to yeah i think we should wrap up soon yeah. i don't yeah. know if we have ideas what to talk about next week yeah what should we talk about next week we need to decide now any suggestions <laughs> yeah please give us an idea in hackmd And thanks to everyone for having such an active discussion here. This is really good. Mm. Yeah, thanks so much for these questions and answers and for watching. Let's see. I'm looking at our old issues to see what we can talk about. I'd still like to learn Rust sometime. Yes, I don't yeah. know it either. Yeah, I can make a demo. But I'm not sure next mm. week. It's... Yeah. No, I think that I like the idea we had before. So I'll install the development environment and you oh, now ants here too. So we install the development environment and you tell us what to do and where trying to do it live and learn live. I want to suggest some topics for beginners. Um, yeah, I like that. Idea. I think that yeah, would I want, we I need to do Rust demo, but it would be good to, and now we've, we've been doing a couple of times relatively. But what, what kind of topic for beginners? Yeah. Like I said, uh, things like, mm, have we done something about the details of our shell or user environments and how we optimize yes, but, it for work? But it was kind of brief still. I mean, we were yeah. like very briefly jumping over bullet points. So it would be good. Maybe we could show more about how we, mm -hmm. how, how our setup is also like team marks for this mm -hmm. shell. Mm -hmm. Or how, what editors, we didn't talk much about editors. Yes, actually, mm -hmm. we could uh, maybe talk about that's what we were saying today, for instance, ah. in the code refinery, where we, we tell people to install, for instance, on Windows uh, Git Bash. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not what you would use. And that's the same mm -hmm. for the shell. We, yeah. we say we use Bash, but you don't use Bash, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then like we can discuss why and uh, yeah. what Yeah, but what, maybe, what yes, editors. yeah. What what, what is IDs. your setting for developing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you use an ID for? Do you have Git integrated? Um, yeah. Hmm. Oh, what shells are I using? I was uh, fish. I will add details there. Yeah. What about debugging? Yes. One said that. Print statement. <laughs> yes. Actually, that would be like go through the different ways we think about yes. debugging things. Yeah, yes. Because I've rarely seen a good introduction to how to think about. For and debugging? It yeah, I find it's uh, so, sometimes very abstract. They are yeah. selling a tool like a DBX mm -hmm. or like Total View or something like that. Yeah. But usually, when you see uh, people debugging, this this is not the primary tool they mm -hmm. will be using. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah. Okay. Debugging is a good idea. Yeah. yeah. So we'll do that. Okay. So please send Great. us some something that doesn't work, and we will do it. <laughs> be careful, we need, uh, <laughs> we need some problems. <laughs> but only few. <laughs> Okay, so with that being said, thanks everyone for watching and commenting so much, and hopefully we can see you next week. Thanks so much, that was fun. Yes, thanks, thank Anna. you. Thanks for chat. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.